is it just too good to be true or or if if it was that easy everybody would be doing and it's it, there's obviously there's fine points and there's qualification and there's nuances but is it really is it really all that it's cracked up to be yeah you know what russ it's a really good question i mean that there's a lot of skepticism when the program first launched and people almost didn't believe it Nadim Kashavji, how are you today, my brother? Looking sharp? Good to hear from you, my friend. What's going on today? Uh, nice to hear from you, too. Nice to be here as well, Russ. Um, things are good. Things are great. Uh, yeah, really excited for this. And uh, always nice to talk to you, Russ. Well, I've been trying to practice your last name, Kashavji. Kashavji. I just had to make sure I phonetically, I've, I've written a note, I have a little post-it note beside my camera. So so if 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 I forget, I, I'll just, we'll just refer to you as Nadim the Dream, almost, huh? <laughs> You nailed it, Russ. You nailed, you nailed the last the last name pronunciation. That's fantastic. Uh, thank well, you. Th- thank you for the for the prompt and the help a week ago. By the way, <laughs> uh, Nadim, um, first and foremost, um, you you have some of the best facial hair game going of of you you got like the best facial hair that i've seen of any mortgage professional or any real estate professional you're always like it's always like it's just and that's what you want to know about your mortgage professionals is that they've just uh, pay attention to the details and you can tell by that by that facial hair you got going on there you got some game going <laughs> thanks russ you your butter it feels like you're buttering me up for some harder questions but i i appreciate it all the same um Best groomed uh, uh, mortgage broker on this podcast. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, you definitely have the best head of hair on this podcast today, for sure. <laughs> well, 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 we will go a little deeper into the conversation and questions than just facial hair and uh, and and grooming tips. But uh, and you're you're out. Where are you where are you today? You're you're out in the Calgary area is where you're living. But you actually have a really cool story. When you and I met about a month ago out in Vancouver, you're you're on a cool little journey. Maybe share with everybody kind of the journey you're on for the next little while here. Yeah, for sure. So like you know, it's it's interesting in the mortgage world. We're you know we we'll get into this later, I'm sure. But we 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 do mortgages across the country, and so we end up uh, finding ourselves working virtually. And post COVID, is you know. It's, COVID's come with some challenges, but also some blessings. And one of them is everyone's comfort with video technology and Zoom and and distance and, and being remote. And so what we've actually found is that a lot of the time we're remote with our clients. And so um, we're actually doing. Um, we are. We have. We have a couple of young kids. They're they're not yet in school, and so we're doing a bit of an adventure with them, where we're going to be working, you know, really hard for the next year. But we're actually going to be doing it in different places. So we're we're, we're um, we're we're selling our home and we're moving uh, to a whole bunch of different places around the world and living in different locations over the next year. Um, so it'll be a bit of an adventure. So today I'm I'm in Canmore, Alberta, just outside of Calgary near near Banff. We'll be here for a couple of months, then Vancouver, and then and we have a few more places lined up after that. So yeah, it's uh, it's an exciting journey. We're just just at the big, beginning of it. Nice. Well, you you've you've planned your work, and now you're working your plan. Like you you've literally designed your business so you can have location freedom in many respects, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I find I travel quite a bit to a few major centers like Toronto, Vancouver, and then Calgary, Edmonton, and so I'm still planning to travel there. But uh, but the rest of the time, yeah, it w- won't be necessarily in one particular location, and we have people in different areas as well to help cover. So it's a uh, it's a nice mix, and uh, I'll let you know how it goes. Well, I'm 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 definitely when you're out in the Vancouver area, you and I are going to be having more coffees than 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 getting together once every like seven years as of, as it was recently here. So so first and foremost, I just want to thank you for coming on today's podcast, and uh, we're going to get into some deep conversation around lending and money and mortgages and specifically right up your alley commercial financing which is near and dear to a lot of people that um you know a lot of people are going that avenue of late is you know sometimes it's easier to add a zero to getting a mortgage a zero on, i always preface that a zero on the left side of the decimal to, to getting a mortgage than just getting uh, when you're tapped out at you know four or five residential properties with your big banks maybe a commercial opportunity is the road to go and we'll definitely get into that okay now there is a question now the, the conversation that I want to talk about is I want to know more about you and I want my audience to know more about you Nadim so where are you from what makes you kind of tick and what's kind of your backstory that led you into this real estate investing mortgage lending super superhero here today yeah for sure well look uh, i mean it's 
Yeah, there's there's quite a bit I can get into, but I'd say, Russ, you know, um, I, I do want to share with your audience that the way we met was um, I had joined the Real Estate Investment Network, Rain, when you were when you were part of it, and um, and you were a host there, a moderator there, many events, and and I, I still remember to this day that you would you would really be open and and vulnerable with your audience. You'd really get in some deep truths. Um, you wouldn't sugarcoat things and. And that really stuck with me. And so I, I'd love to repay the favor and really go deep here and, and be open and, and honest and tell you sort of, um, yeah, just exactly what my background is like and be vulnerable. And um, yeah, I'll, so I just want to preface that a little yep. bit. Nice. Well, yeah. thank you for saying that. I, I remember our conversations many times and you and I had multiple phone conversations and and I've watched your evolution and journey. And honest to goodness, it's nothing short of inspirational, to be honest, from from where you were to where you are now. And and I honestly think you're only in like the third or fourth inning of a nine inning ball game. You've just started, to be honest. Yeah, for sure. And, and I, yeah, I re, I'll, I'll repay that back to you. Like yeah. the, the inspir- like you, that you were part of that inspiration as well at the start of that journey. So I, I appreciate that. Oh, cool. Well, well, where did it get started? What was kind of yeah. for you, you know, little Nadim? Yeah, so, what, what was kind of the backstory here? Yeah, for sure. So so look, I, you know, like um, I'll, I'll start with sort of the the background, the professional background. So the professional background for me, I started with um, uh, I, I started my career in, in accounting. Uh, that was. Uh, sort of the starting point for me. I got an accounting designation, um, and then I, I didn't feel as challenged or stimulated, so I got an MBA. Went into a, a management consulting career for a few years, and um, ho- hoping to get more more mental stimulation, more excitement. Um, and it, you know, it it came th- that was there, but it also came with a, a lot of travel, very long hours, a lot of intensity, and and ultimately, I sort of had had a moment um, in my life where I sort of you know working crazy hours and you know uh, working really hard, doing lots of of work that you know was and in some ways was was it was a role that people wanted wanted to get to or get into, but I find I was I didn't feel that fulfillment that I really craved in my life, and so I I thought. I really, get, I really reflect, and I took some time to reflect on what did I want, what did I want to do with my life, what, what area did I want to go into, and and really, I ended up landing on real estate as something that was always a passion of mine, but never really, uh, never really something that I, I went after because I sort of chased after the safe route or something I thought was maybe more, uh, more predictable. Uh, but then I, I realized that life's too short to to go the safe route, and I, I got to make a change and go into into real estate. And so, with that, I, I took some time to explore where in real estate I wanted to go. Um, you know, residential versus commercial, and I found that with my with my background and skill set, I thought commercial would be a better fit. And then within that, further as well, um, explored a lot of different areas. But but financing again was a fit with my background was also an area that allowed me to to see an entire transaction and really understand it from start to finish. Yep. And so then I decided, okay, within commercial real estate, it's going to be finance. And within finance, I'm looking at either working for lenders or brokerage. And within I, I found um, the, the biggest thing was that brokerage would really allow me to see a wider range of types of deals, whereas every lender had their own little, little niche. So for me, it was really a path of learning. So I sort of went into... I uh, went into it from the perspective of where can I learn the most? What sort of a fit with my skill set? So I landed on commercial mortgage brokerage, and I was lucky enough to have a brokerage, uh, a large national bro- commercial mortgage brokerage, take me on. But interestingly enough, I had you know gotten lots of letters behind my name and an MBA and uh, you know lots of different positions and titles, but really to get into the industry, the brokerage had said you got to start at the very bottom. Uh, all that you know, it's it's nice that you have that, but you really got to learn the industry, and it was. A tough decision because it was a big step down for me in terms of position, title, compensation, the whole sort of gamut. And um, you know, to be honest, it was it was one of the, like, reflecting back was one of the best decisions I've ever made. It was and it was a really hard one at the time. I'm glad I did it, but sort of really stepping in, learning from the basics, from the foundation, and working my way up, which is what ended up happening. Is I ended up working my way up in that organization and um, and sort of got to. To, I started as an analyst, you know, worked into a senior analyst position, and then an associate director, director, senior director. And at this stage, I have my own book of business, and I'm and I'm out there um, working with clients directly. And and it was, um, yeah, it was it was it was really fun. Really allowed me to learn the the base the basics on upwards. So it really gave me a strong foundation. Um, and then I got to a point in my career where I was I was. Um, 
working with lots of different clients and and uh, you know my my model is is really to help anyone and everyone that I can. It wasn't really to be selective or you know I I, I love helping people and so what I found was that the the organization that I was part of I don't think supported wasn't set up to support that sort of model of of helping as many people as I wanted to and so I found that my clients had to wait longer uh, for for the results and I, I really don't um, I, I really take it at heart to deliver for my clients and so it actually led me to starting my own brokerage uh, a few years ago uh, with the intention really to serve my clients to a higher standard to 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 a better level um, and so then left started my own brokerage a few years ago and um, it's been a really fun yeah it's been a really fun ride and it's been exciting and enjoyable and uh, and busy but but very very fulfilling for us i would say it's been uh another another decision i'm very grateful to have been guided to because um yeah it's been it's been very fulfilling and it allows allows us to serve our clients to a really high level and and live um and yeah live live sort of the, the life that uh, that we'd like wow Woo wee, you said a mouthful there, brother. Hang on a second here. You might need a glass of water because it's getting hot in here, brother, right? <laughs> oh, and, and and here's the thing. Woo wee. I always love when bombs start happening. I, I have a feeling there's an awful lot more depth there too. You <laughs> went through a story pretty pretty quick, and I have a feeling that we could dive into you know the obstacles and the challenges and the struggles and 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 a lot of that kind of stuff there yourself. Like, to be honest, and I remember. I was surprised that it's been two years since you started your own your own firm. And I remember when the announcement came out and I said, that, good for you. That was awesome. I think I sent you a virtual high five and, you know, let's go get them and stuff like that. What was that like kind of going from an umbrella kind of top cover, if you will, <laughs> to going out all on your all on your lonesome and all on your own with and I imagine you couldn't take any business with you, you couldn't take any of your book of business with you, but they all knew you and probably a lot of them came with you. But what was that like going out onto your own there, my friend? Yeah, you know what, Russ, um it to be honest, it was it was a little scary. Um it, it was it was intimidating and it, and and if I didn't have a big enough why, if I didn't have a big enough push or reason, I probably wouldn't have done it. it would have been too comfortable, too easy to stay. Um, but I, but I, but I, I really had that that why that really drove me, which was, which like like I said, ser- serve my clients to a higher standard, to a standard that I wanted, and, and it allowed allowed me to also build something from the ground up that that I think would would really be based on on principles that I really align with around transparency, collaboration, uh, ultra high degree of service, um, and and not really not really being being limited to a specific range of loan sizes or asset class or geography but really being able to to take uh take one and all and and guide them through through the journey so i would say like to answer your question russ it was it was scary um and i needed and you know the other thing the other thing i'll add too is that if i knew what i knew now in terms of what it really takes to start a business i don't know if i would have done it and i'm but i'm also really grateful that I didn't know exactly what I was getting into because I may not have done it and it's been really fulfilling. So, so I would say it was, um, my, you know, ignorance is blessed sometimes. And, and it, was, <laughs> it was, it's funny. I was, I had the exact same thing in my head. It was just sitting there. Sometimes you didn't have anybody telling you that you can't do it or couldn't do it or shouldn't do it. Now that you actually look back upon it yourself, you go, holy shit, what did I do? <laughs> right. And then you go, thank goodness nobody was at that time telling me what I couldn't do because you really, you know, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, I'm just kind of reiterating what you said, is you leaped before you were ready and you you didn't have the, you had the qualifications, but you weren't fully, you didn't have it, you hadn't done it yet. And you did it anyways, yeah. right? Yeah, the saying I really love is, is uh, burn the boats to take the island. I don't know if you've heard that saying before, but, you know, to, like really just, just, really committing to something means like get get rid of the safety net and really just leap in and that forces you to find a way to to do what you need to do yeah and that it's funny you, you say that that was just a couple of guests of mine ago just recently with seth ferguson he mentioned told a story where he hit rock bottom and then usually on rock bottom you get dragged along the rock bottom for a long period of time and he finally just said you know what time to burn the boats and then you know he He's putting on one of Canada's largest uh, multifamily conferences this coming weekend with like three, four thousand or whatever. How many people are going to be there? 
stuff like that. So I really do resonate with that. But but before we do pivot off that into the the real in depth uh, conversation here, um, born and raised Calgarian, or where where did you originally come from, my friend? Yeah, I, so I was born actually in East Africa and okay. lived there until I was fourteen years old, and then and then sort of moved to the to the U.S. for uh, for a year, and then and then on to Canada. What about uh, from East Africa? Uh, Kenya. Okay. Have you? Do you go go back? Have you ever been back, or have a desire to go back? Yeah, I, I hadn't, hadn't been back in the in the first ten years since I left, but then I and then I went back, and it's actually funny. I, I, a little story for you. I, I grew up there, and, and a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people around the world think of going to Kenya to go on safari and, and really see the animals and the wildlife there. But having actually grown up there, I didn't actually do that, and so. I actually went back when I got married. I, went, I took my wife in a honeymoon and it was her first safari. And I was like, you know what? I grew up here, but it's my my first safari too, because I never did. So it's one of those lessons that like sometimes you take things for granted that are that are just around you that you don't really realize until later. So oh, that's cool. to, be able to do that. But yeah, that was it. So I, I did go back. Is uh, it highly recommended to go do a safari? Absolutely. Um, like I can't I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, it was it was incredible. Incredible, incredible journey, and uh, I actually really want to take my kids now that they're a bit older to to check it out as well. I, I think they'll absolutely love it, so All I right. highly recommend it. Nice. Now, now before we do pivot off to the the conversation, if you're when you're not uh, serving your clients to the highest level possible, and you're not doing that, what uh, what are some of your hobbies, and what do you like to do for for what do you like to? I know work is fun and business is fun. And you and one thing you said when we, we worked together is asked you how the new business venture was going. You said, I've never worked harder in my life over the past two years. And that's good. That's that's what that's what you want. And now it's rewarding. And now you're starting to bear some of the fruit of all that hard work. But what do you like to do in your spare time? Yeah. I so I, I a few things. I, I love I love skiing in the winter. So luckily, you know, living somewhere that's relatively cold is it has its advantages. I love skiing in the winter. Um, I love kayaking in the summer and being on water. Um, and then I'm, I'm a very avid soccer fan. So I, I've, I went to the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. I love seeing um, live live uh, soccer matches and, and follow the Premier League quite closely. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my that's my East African roots speaking because we grew up speaking. Uh, we grew up uh, playing soccer morning, evening and night. So you're a fan of the beautiful game, are you? There you go. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, have you have you ever watched the Ted Lasso series? I did. Yeah. And I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. We're just on episode or season three right now too. I just, that's phenomenal. It's, it's one of those very high, um, witty humor that just, it's fun. And I just love the British accent and the British way of speaking and things like that too. So, okay. So we've, it's, it's almost like our dating app you know, We've, 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 we've covered your hobbies and what you like to do and, you know, long walks on the beach down by the bow river. And, and, uh, you know, we found out all those kind of things and what TV shows you like now, now it's time to get to bound to business. You ready to get down to business, my brother? Let's do it. <laughs> all right. So commercial financing, big, broad umbrella topic, to be honest. And most, I, I would argue, I would suffice to say, if that's a correct terminology, that most people in my audience um, are very familiar with, you know, residential financing, mortgages that they get, typical houses, making that transition into commercial is, is the next step for a lot of people. Um, what's some of the differences between commercial, and no, first of all, are, is it commercial financing and residential financing, or how do you even how does it how does the industry separate that? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I, so the, the way I the way I separate it is, I'll say it's re residential mortgages to me are sort of single family uh, homes, or people buy a home for themselves, or maybe some investment properties up to four units. Then the industry typically says if it's five or more units, now you're talking about multifamily financing. Uh, commercial financing, you know, includes multifamily, but also retail, office, industrial, all those other asset classes. And then it generally also includes construction financing for all of those asset classes as well. So I would say commercial is a big umbrella that should capture everything. But uh, if you just say, you know, commercial, multifamily, construction really covers everything that we do. So I guess maybe a, a simple way of putting it, and I'm, like I'm from Saskatchewan, I try to make things as simple as possible is, Residential financing is single family houses, four units and less. Everything else is commercial. Perfect. Okay. Woo. I, do I get a gold star as a starting, as a starter, <laughs> star people? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it, here's the thing is I, I, it's funny. And then I was having a conversation the other day with somebody and we're, and we'll get into this a little bit more about 
Um, and this was my belief, you know, was talking about the MLI select program with CMHC, which we will get into. And uh, the person asked me the question is, well, does, you know, CMHC, does the government give you the money? And I sit there and go, I go, yeah, actually, the government doesn't have the money. I believe they, they would just they just guarantee that it'll be paid if, if it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't foreclose or if it gets foreclosed on the government will guarantee the payment. Right. So we'll get into that. And sometimes you have to take, um, the point I was trying to get to is uh, just don't take, um, for granted that this is a complex topic. And sometimes just the nuances really matter when it comes to this stuff as well. Right. Okay, so within residential and commercial, what are some of the differences between that, what you would say, like simple differences? Yeah, so I would say like like one, you know, one key difference would be uh, commercial financing really, qualification for it really is based on net worth of the individuals as opposed to their personal income. It's probably one of the first most important differences to that we we educate people on is, you know, people are used to thinking, well, what, what's my personal income and how does that drive my, my debt service, my total debt service, TDS and GDS ratios? And what are, what are my debts and what are those ratios like? On the commercial side to qualify, typically it's based on net worth. A lot of commercial real estate investors may not declare a lot of personal income. And so really it's, I think it's a more common sense approach, especially for investors looking at the equity that they have in the real estate that they own really being key. And then the income typically comes from the property itself. So the income is coming from the property to pay the mortgage and the net worth provides that backstop for lenders to know where money might come from to fix any problems that might arise. Well, so, yeah. And interesting yeah. to note and, and gang, you know, success leaves clues on people with high net worth probably don't declare a lot of income. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people sit there and go, well, I have very high income, but I don't have high net worth. Maybe you just got to flip that pyramid around a little bit there. And and something that I once resonated with me, and, and this is something I might even heard from you, I, I'm not even sure, is there was kind of a hierarchy of, you know, on residential, it's, you know, income, then, you know, net worth, and then your credit, and then the last is the property. And then on commercial side, it's property, um, no, it's property net worth something, and then income is at the bottom almost. Or, or is that some? Is that kind of? Do you have like a hierarchy of what it is for for you? Yeah, I think I think you summed it up really well. It's it's the the net worth for the qualification, the property for the income. Credit scores play a play a part as well, but not credit credit scores aren't as highly valued as they are in the residential world too. Um, and then, and then you also have you also have mortgages that may not require any kind of guarantee. Like you, you could have a what we call a non-recourse mortgage, where the leverage is isn't that high, and there's actually no personal guarantees required. And then often, as well as people grow their portfolio, you can have a corporate guarantee. And so, if you have a company that owns a bunch of real estate, that company provides a guarantee as opposed to the individual. Um, so. Yeah, so I, I would say the yeah, it's an interesting nuance there with guarantees. Yeah. Um okay, so just for just for sake of clarification, non recourse. Now I'm familiar with what non recourse means in Alberta. It's one of the, it's actually an Alberta advantage of of investing in Alberta's non recourse residential financing. Um what does non recourse mean? So so non recourse in, in our in our world would be essentially if a property were to be foreclosed and a bank were to take it back or lender were to take it back and try to sell it to recover the mortgage proceeds and there was a shortfall, they wouldn't be able to go after the borrower or the previous owner of the property to make up for that difference. Really, an owner can can essentially walk away from the property and it's really the lender's responsibility to to make up for uh, for the mortgage amount. Yeah. And and in this and in the world you deal with, the asset is the property and, and that's what's most important. And they just want to know, the lender wants to know if we have to take this sucker back, are we able to recover our losses or they actually might make some money off of it. You never know, right? Um, yeah. So they just want to make sure that the asset can support the business because most people in this world, and in, and you could correct me if I'm wrong with what I point I'm about to make next, is most people, you almost have to have a corporate structure and even to apply for a commercial financing. So they want to make sure that the asset is sound when they lend against it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, having, having a 
uh, and a company to own the real estate is is definitely very common. But people are actually able to own real estate and get a commercial mortgage if they own it personally as well. So it's actually not out of the question. There's just some restrictions on now, it. Now, is that is that a main? And I I heard this once, and I don't know if that's correct or not. But is that a, a more so of an Alberta? Uh, uh, course of action that they most lenders in Alberta properties want a corporate entity that they're lending against, or or is that um, or did I hear that incorrectly? No, it's uh, across the country. Across the country, um, okay. Yeah, across the country, it's it's common to have uh, corporate ownership of real estate, like having a company own real estate, and individuals can also own real estate uh, and get a, a commercial real estate and get a commercial mortgage. Uh, the restriction is that if you own it personally, you can't actually get a mortgage term longer than five years. So if you wanted to get a 10 year mortgage and you own it personally, you can't actually do that. As okay. a mortgage. Well, that's, that's good to know because a lot of people, once they start becoming a little bit more savvy in the world, they, you know, need corporate structures and corporate shields and tax deferrals and, you know, um, family trusts and ways of distributing wealth and all those kinds of things. You need more sophistication on, on that. And it's nice to know that in the commercial world, that's what they look for as well. Now, commercial lending, from my experience as well, and I, and I know this will not translate well on podcast, is I'm holding my hand out here, is mostly in commercial lending, it's it's pay me first before I, I do things. I know that's not a bad term to use, but but it is a lot, it, it can be a lot more transactional heavy on fees. Would that be correct? Yeah. In terms in terms of getting a getting commercial mortgage, you're right. There are there definitely are more fees uh to consider than that you would in a residential mortgage. Yeah. Sometimes in a residential mortgage you find a good mortgage broker. The mortgage broker gets paid by the lender and you actually the only thing you have to pay is maybe a, a lawyer fee, uh an appraisal fee and a, and a nice gift for your mortgage broker. Right. In the yeah, commercial exactly. world it's a little different, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. There's, there's transaction fees and, and they tend to be higher as well. Like a commercial appraisal will cost more than a residential appraisal. Commercial legal fees will cost more than a residential legal legal yeah. fees. And so there's 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 other costs and the, and the costs that are similar are usually a bit high. They're they're not so so often as you're doing a, a smaller transaction, it may seem like some of those fees uh, can be material, but interestingly enough, those fees don't actually change as much. Like an appraisal or legal fees will be the same whether you're doing a $1 million mortgage or a $25 million mortgage. It, it may not actually change very much. So it's, it, so it's it's often can be suited to larger loans, but anyway, all the same, it's important to be aware of. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree. And and it's, it's like I tell people sometimes if the... If the mortgage loan amount is larger, the the fees are a little bit more palatable than if it's, you're just looking for, you know, a million dollar mortgage and you got to pay a thirty thousand dollar fees on it and stuff like that. It's just like gulp, right? And in some cases, some of it's added to the mortgage balance, is it not? In some cases, yeah. So there's there's it's actually I, I actually really like it because I find it's it's really transparent. You can actually there's actually we can we we'll, we'll get into multifamily and CMC mortgages, but there's actually the ability there to to choose, a borrower can actually choose whether whether they pay the mortgage broker or the lender pays the mortgage broker, and the and the difference is that if the lender pays the mortgage broker, they just have to agree to pay to a slightly higher interest rate. Agree to pay a slightly higher interest rate. Um, okay. And we can run the math and say, you know, they end up they end up paying a bit more over the course of the term if they pay a bit more in rates, but they'll have more money in their pocket up front. So it's sort of a trade off that people can make. Right. Uh, and, and then in some cases, um, you know, for example, if you, you're you borrowing $2 million and let's say, I'm just going to use really rough numbers so I can figure it out. And let's say there was a $50,000 fee, something that they potentially, in in essence, you're borrowing $2 million and, and 50000 in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. And and as we know, typically in this world of commercial, when you have multiple units and multiple tenants and stuff, and I know this is not maybe not the most popular thing to say out there, but who pays the mortgage, guys? It, it's our tenants in many respects, right? All right. Yep. So so awesome. Um, anything else people need to be aware of of some of the questions that come to you and people just need to have that when they're looking to make that transition from from a residential into commercial, what 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 are some of the conversations you have with people fairly regularly that you just you know want to get out onto the public here of something that you just have that same question you answer quite a bit? Yeah, for sure. So there's a few things. I mean, one one of the things to think about is that interest rates are going to be different from what you see on the residential side to what you see on the commercial side. Um, I would say you know uh, for commercial mortgages for for asset classes like retail, office, industrial. Often you have interest rates that are that are higher than what you might pay on a on a residential mortgage. Um, however, on the multifamily side, 
CMAT mortgages uh, can can be a little bit cheaper than what you find on uh, on the residential market side. So interest rates are different depending, it could be higher or lower than residential depending on what asset class and mortgage type you're doing. That's one. Uh, the other one is amortization. So amortization on the multifamily side now can be up to 50 years. Um, and on other asset classes, other commercial asset classes, generally 25 years, sometimes up to 30. I would say those would probably be the, the big ones. Uh, loan to value is also different as well. Um, on the multifamily side, you can actually, there's, there's a 100% loan to value product, but, uh, 95% loan to value, uh, more commonly on the multifamily side. And then on the other commercial asset classes, you can get up to uh, 75% leverage typically is a typical maximum. Uh, for an, a property that is what we call stabilized. So uh, income is at market. Yep. 75% is a typical leverage. Um, so that's so that's different to think about as well. And then I would say the other thing I would say, Russ, is you know, the when I look at residential mortgages from afar, because I don't do any, I see uh, more and more restrictions coming in uh, from the government and regulatory bodies to restrict investors' ability to get mortgages or the amount of mortgages they can get. And actually, on the commercial side, ironically, we've seen in ma- in many respects things get actually easier and less restrictions being put on. So you know, I, I almost I'd almost say commercial mortgages are actually more investor friendly than residential mortgages are because residential mortgages I think are designed for the, the homeowner purchaser, and if you know investors can sort of, sort of have to try and fit that box with commercial mortgages, everybody's an investor, yeah. most people are, and so so it really is. I find. More conducive to investors, and and I think some of the regulations are more common hmm. sense, uh, well, less restrictive. And we're going to get into a little bit some of the details as well, because the details matter on this. Like like for for example, um, two two things I'm going to share here. Number one is I remember somebody once said way back in the days, "What's the difference between commercial financing and residential financing? Everything is different, right?" <laughs> And they're the same type of a, a vehicle, but they're literally all the variables can be, can be completely different. Um, the next thing I, I'm sit there and I go, well, well, geez, you can get, you know, potentially in some cases better interest rates, um, in some cases longer amortizations, in some cases you can get lower loan to values, and in some cases you can qualify corporately and the property qualifies. Maybe you have to have less stringent. And you sit there and I just rattled off, you know, five really cool benefits and. And somebody's sitting there going, well, yeah, like, what's the catch? Like, what is the catch, Nadim? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, I suppose, like, you know, you touched on one of them, which is which is fees. Like, you know, especially as you, as you first transition, that might might come as a bit of an adjustment is like understanding that there, there's there's fees and different type of fees involved. And otherwise, you know, the larger dollars potentially. So, you know, the, the ticket size to enter is a little bit is a little bit higher, typically at least five units to get in to, to um, that's sort of the, the entry point. So. A um, couple of catches there, but um, I, don't, I don't think they're they're necessarily um, overwhelming. Yeah, and then one of the things I've I've found as well a little bit of a catch, and this is the conversation I have with people too, is outside of and you can correct me if I'm out, if I'm out of my league with what I'm saying. You have 100 percent permission to tell me I'm wrong. Um, outside of CMHC insured financing, you just go the traditional route on commercial. In many cases, you you won't get as high a loan to value. Like you might have to put thirty five percent down on it. In many cases, if it's non not insured, right? In in many cases, so you know on a on a couple million dollar asset, you might need a million dollars to have to in, in capital to put up as well. Yeah, for sure. You're right. Like commercial assets typically cap out at 75% loan to value. So you need to put at least 25% down residentially. It might be, it might cap out at 80%. Um, So yeah, absolutely. And and it might be less than that too, because it actually, the amount of leverage you get depends on the, how much income the property is spitting out. Well, that was the next point I was about to get to, because in the commercial and multifamily apartment building world, as a buyer, what you want to do is you want to find underperforming assets that are not generating good income. Then you go qualify for your financing and you get you have to qualify based upon the current numbers and, and you have to pony up an awful lot more capital. But that's where the big opportunity is, is that you can raise the NOIs. You raise the NOIs and then the new valuation after. So there's just a little bit more flexibility with that. But but it's very capital intensive to buy an underperforming commercial asset up front, is it not? 
Yeah, it can be. It can be. Um, and actually, like you, you, you actually remind me of, a, of an important point we should mention, which is that you know on, on the residential side, you know, it's interesting. You, you buy a property, and what what's important is looking at people value that by comparable. So, what is what are other people paying for the same property? Or even if you're selling it, what people look at, what did you pay and how much are you selling it for now? On the, in the commercial world, the valuation is really based on the income. And so if you go in there and you, and you improve the income quickly, um, the value goes can go up sig- significantly. And there's no real feedback or questions on how much you bought it for, how much you spent and how much it's worth. It's really what it's worth is a function of the income. And it's, it's sort of much more clear cut. There's less... There's less art to it yeah. um, than there is in the residential world. Yeah, and then also in commercial, there would be an awful lot more what I would consider um, a little bit more um, st- strategy. Like you, you let's say you find something significantly undervalued, underperforming. You come in and you can't upfront get a good loan to value thing. You might take a, a shorter term commercial. You might have some bridge financing. You might have vendor take backs. You might be able to get a. Um, Oh, I lost the term when you assign, not assignments, um, when you can take over their mortgages. Oh, yes. Agreement for Agreement sale. Agreement for sale is a lot more prevalent in, in commercial as well. So it's a lot more strategic and there's a lot more chess moves in, in commercial. Would you say that's the case? Yeah, I think it's, it's really well put, Russ. I, I think that the, you, you, have, you have more business-minded um, sellers and buyers. Um, and so you have things like vendor take back mortgages or VTBs being much more common. You have agreements for sale being much more common, exactly as you've alluded to. Um, you have longer closings, like, you know, you have, you have people that are, that are much more business minded. You can get some, some pretty neat structures and, um, for sure. Nice. Can nice. More yeah. Well, well, gang, we're, we're diving into the, we're going to dive into a couple products that are out there right now but just as an fyi quick check in here i'm here with nadim the dream kashavji kash kashavji kashavji i have to always have to phonetically say it so and uh so a couple things that are out there right now that are making a lot of airwaves and that's um and, and I'm not going to say this too loud because uh, who knows who's listening. But but uh, for once, the government is actually providing more than lip service to something. Is they're, they're actually putting some resources behind helping investors create density, helping investors buy investment-grade property. And they've came out with a little over a year ago this program called the MLI Select Program. Um, for somebody that maybe hasn't heard that, can you maybe give us kind of the the quick tour about what what that's all about, Nadim? Yeah, for sure. So, like before we dive into the MLI Select, I want to give people an overview of what CMHC financing is like uh, in general. So, for for many many years, a few decades, in fact, CMHC's had a program where they provided up to eighty five percent loan to value, up to forty year amortizations, and and had this program where the 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 interest rates are also below market. And so what CMHC is actually doing is they're not actually lending the money as you're alluding to earlier. You actually alluded to the point I'm about to make, which is that they're actually insuring the mortgage and providing an insurance for the mortgage. And so what that means is that when, when if there were to be a default, then CMHC may be able to step in to cure that default. And they are taking the risk off of lenders. And so when the risk comes off for lenders, Two things, two things I want to mention is, is one, lenders are able to provide a lower interest rate because it's rates are usually a function of risk and less risk, lower rates. So that's really good. The other thing is that the, the, it's an insurance product. And so like if you get car insurance or home insurance, you got to pay an insurance premium. The same thing here with CMHC, you have to pay a CMHC insurance premium. Now, CMHC actually is really nice because they actually lend you the premium instead of you paying it. They can actually lend it to you and add it to your mortgage, which is a really nice benefit. Yeah. So coming back to it, 85% leverage, 40 year amortizations and insurance premiums, which at, at its peak, you know, if you get maximum leverage of 85% and a maximum amortization of 40 years, you pay an insurance premium of five and a quarter percent of the loan amount. And usually that would actually pay for itself within the first five years based on your savings of interest rate compared to a non-CMAC insured loan. So right. really good product as it was. Then in March of, of 2022, CMAC came out and said they really wanted to support three key social outcomes is what they call it. And the first one being affordable housing. As we know, there's a, there's a big challenge with affordability 
um, in, in the country. So that was a big outcome for them. The second one is energy efficiency. So they wanted to have improved, they wanted to have incentives for improved energy efficiency. And finally, for accessibility. So handicap access, access to buildings for people that are less able to be able to access the, um, the property. And so, so they said, because they wanted to encourage these three social outcomes, what they said is they actually came up with a tier or point system to say, the more of these social outcomes you support, the more benefits we will give you as CMHC. And so there's three key tiers and, and the, the, the top, top level tier basically allows for up to 95% leverage. So going from 85 to 95% leverage, taking amortizations from 40 years to 50 years. And those insurance premiums I mentioned that were as high as five and a quarter percent previously are now as low as one percent. Um, and so significant, significant incentives in the program, uh, that they, that they came up with. The other thing that is a nuance as well is that there was a, a debt service coverage ratio of 1.3, meaning the property has to have income of $130 for every $100 of mortgage payment. And that's how they would also limit the mortgage amount. Now that debt service coverage got tightened to 1.1, meaning that you actually don't have to have as much income in relation to the mortgage payment to be able to qualify for a mortgage. So it actually also allowed for higher leverage too. So it's a bit of a nuance there, but all that, all to say that that really uh, provided a ton of incentives for investors and developers of, of multifamily property to create and maintain more housing. Yeah. And uh, uptake has been extremely strong. Uh, it's been a really popular product. Um, and we've, there's, there's been many people buying buildings uh, or getting into multifamily more so than they have before because of this program. It's really, it's really driven the multifamily sector and frankly complements the government, as you had alluded to earlier, I think they did a really good job with this program. Yep. Now it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not perfect. I think it's got, it's got the ability to have some tweaks to really, really tailor social outcomes more to what um, would benefit, uh, the, I think, the, the population in terms of the social outcomes. But, you know, in terms of getting uptake, it's been phenomenal. Yeah. And I imagine you, you would have more insight than this because you're on the inside of the industry. And this is just my take from an outside outsider looking in as an investor looking in, and, and it was kind of launched a little over a year ago, and it was it was kind of quietly launched, and it was just kind of oh, there's something coming out, and then all of a sudden, it started. People started whispering, "Is have you heard about this? Do you do you actually know some of the benefits of this?" And then all of a sudden, it got going and got going and got going, and it it caught some it caught some serious momentum, so much so to the part of. You know, they're probably a little bit backed up with a whole bunch of applications. And also, I know it's been successful because they just raised the rates on and fees on some of these things again, haven't they, just recently? Um, yes. So so is that something kind of the way you saw it happen? Or was it right off the bat, big fanfare and everybody's going, holy crap, look at this? Yeah, you know what, Russ? I was shouting from the rooftops like when this came out. I was telling everybody, guys, this is incredible. Let's pay attention. And frankly, I think... Uh, people that were in the industry found out about it quite quickly and really pivoted towards it. But it's it's sort of the broader real estate community that um, residential investors that weren't really as familiar or had the sources or knew where where to look for this information that maybe took a little longer to get yeah. to. But um, well, and one of yeah. the things I can tell you a little bit too is because I have conversation with people national is uh, you know because one of the criteria is affordability and. Um, out in Ontario, out Eastern Canada, it's like they go, well, why would we want to have affordable rent? We can barely make it cash flow at unaffordable rents, <laughs> right? So it, it's it been a little bit more of a, a prairie Western Canadian thing, a little bit more than Eastern Canada at the moment, but there's a lot of people taking advantage of the accessibility and the energy efficiencies and stuff like that too. You don't, it doesn't just have to be affordability at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, Russ. Affordability is something that, um, you know, it, it is more popular in the prairies. And, um, you know, ironically, in areas where affordability is needed more, greater Toronto area, greater Vancouver, greater Victoria area, um, it's the, the way the affordability is defined makes it more challenging to achieve. And so people yep. have actually been going more for energy efficiency in those in those areas. Yep. And, and I saw a presentation once from a good friend. I, I'm not sure. Do you know, do you know, and I'm... Um, a low, oh, gee, Derek, Derek Lobo. Do you know Derek? Yeah. 
And he, he did a wonderful presentation. He goes, gang, and he was making a presentation to a committee and, and uh, of professionals. And he says, gang, if you want to encourage people to build more supply, which we agree we need more supply of housing in Canada. If you need that, you need to make it easier and you need to protect margins of the people taking the risk and the developers. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. They're not going to just pocket it all. In order for them to pass those savings on to the end user, they have to maintain their margins, right? And uh, I think this is a step in the right direction from, from our governing body of CMHC with, with these financing things. And the last thing I'm going to say before we, we dive a little deeper, I, I always get a chuckle when I hear insurance premiums on mortgages. It's the only insurance that I know of that I have to pay the premium, but somebody else gets the benefit of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Is that a fair assessment? Like, like seriously, I, we as the person yeah. taking it have to pay, but the person who gets the benefit is the lender on it. But don't get me wrong. At the end of the day, it's one of those necessary things. If I'm able to get high loan to values, better interest rates, longer amortizations, sign me up, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's a really good, really good point. But that's one, one way to think about it. It's a benefit you, you do get is the, the lower interest rate and the higher, higher yes. amortizations. And the okay. So, so Nadim, we've had a couple of internet issues and I, I make the joke, I was just chatting with Carlene Sue a little while ago and I make the joke, it's because of all those 50,000 Albertans moving into the Southern Alberta that everybody's starting to tap into all the internet signal that's out there as well. <laughs> okay, so, um, so before we dive into some of the things and, and the two sides of the, the MLI I want to chat about is I want to talk about construction and I want to talk about kind of the completion type of things. And you walked me through in a in a, a, a little while a, a, a week or so ago all the steps that are going there and it's like holy macaroni this guy knows what he's talking about and i need to get him on a podcast here is there some place that somebody can go to go check out some of this information about it do some of their own reading and stuff on on, on top of what we're talking about here as well yeah and we, we put together a few articles um and we're actually about to come out with a few videos that really simplify and explain how uh, how this program works and and how that all comes together um, so if so, are you going to put are you putting it on your oh I don't have your website there oh, hang on a sec there it is um, on your website is there a place where people would go to go check it out yeah we're actually in the process of updating it so we're going to have we're going to have a section that's called insights and in there we're going to put uh, a few videos a few um, a few pieces of, of information yeah. that allows people to check that out well but I would be remiss and I'm going to do a cardinal sin here in a second about dating a podcast as well as uh, what's going on bond yields my friend They're, they've just jumped up 11 percent in the last little while here is so are we going to see some interest rates and going up here yeah well it's you know like it's interesting like so um a couple of things one I'll, one I'll just just for your for your readers uh, for your listeners and viewers I'll say bond deals are really what drive interest rates and so what you're looking at there is the five year government of Canada bond deal and so that's that's typically what drives interest rates in the commercial world the impact is instantaneous so for example if you're looking at the five year government of Canada bond and you're getting a, a loan on an industrial property then say your interest rate might be 2% above that bond deal. And so at the time that you're ready to lock that interest rate in, you look at that. And if you're locking in rate today as opposed to last week, you'd be pretty upset because the rates will have gone up immediately. Yeah. On the residential side, you actually see that happen. It, it, it's a little bit of a lag. Bond yields go up. And then if they stay up or stay down, residential interest rates change. Got so, it. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's it's, it's interesting. I mean, interest rates, uh, I would say they went up a few days ago. Uh, there was some higher inflation numbers that were released than were expected. And so that um, that caused interest rates to jump up a little bit. Yeah. Now, just as an FYI, before we do pivot off to this, I did find there is some really good information on the CMHC website. Now, and I say good, I, I say a little tongue in cheek, meaning it is a government based website. And if you are looking, if you're having some hard time sleeping at night, definitely download the fact sheet and read it all in detail. But if you just Google MLI Select, um, CMHC does have a lot of resources there. But I would much rather listen to uh, a person walk me through the real life, real world application of it. Okay. So do you mind if we we, we go deep uh, into a couple things? So Step one is I want to talk about uh, the commercial, I mean, the uh, construction side of things. If somebody was maybe wanting to build and they were wanting to do some construction on things, what kind of what kind of options are there for financing if somebody was to do construction? What are some of the 
the, the fine print? What are some of the qualification requirements in the process a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So I would say like construction financing, a few things I would highlight. One is that the the net worth or qualification requirements are typically a little bit more stringent since doing construction financing, building something from the ground up is typically seen as having a little bit more risk to it. So if someone's considering doing construction financing, keep in mind, you know, having having a certain amount of net worth is important. In fact, maybe uh, good to touch on uh, CMHC, for example, likes to have a net worth of 25% of the loan amount. So if you're applying for a mortgage of a million dollars, CMHC likes to see that you have a net worth of at least 250000 um, And that could include things like cash, investments, mutual funds, equity in the real estate you own, including your primary residence, cash value of, of life insurance. It could include um, loans that you've made to other people that, that that where they owe you money back. So that could all that's all net worth. And so the point I'm making is that construction mortgages have a higher threshold um, than an existing building for what lenders and CMT like to look for from net worth. So that's the first thing I would yep. say. Um, this the second thing is you know it, it tends to be a little bit more you know you have, you have to have a little more net worth can be a little bit more capital intensive as well. And there's different ste- steps to it. So you might have to consider buying the land. That you're looking to build them and maybe getting a mortgage on it. You know, if it if it's got an existing house on it, you might go to get a residential mortgage on it. If not, or if it's vacant land, or if you can't qualify, getting a commercial mortgage. Then you got to work on, on getting a whole team together. So you got to think about having an architect or a designer. You got to think about uh, who's going to build it, whether you're going to build it yourself. If so, what what's your experience like doing that? Because if you're doing your first one, you know, you may have to really consider putting more cash in or paying a higher interest rate because it's seen as higher risk. Or what I often recommend for a first project is hire somebody to build it for you. So you're involved in the process, but you're not doing it yourself the very first time and you can learn from it. Yeah, so let's go build that. a condo tower. It's the first time I've ever done it. I'll just go do it yeah. myself on a whim here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, exactly. I have I have a full-time job. and <laughs> <laughs> No, exactly. I get, I, I get. I didn't. I was funny when I was doing some of these projects. I go. I go. You mean that's an option for somebody to do it themselves? Like, <laughs> and I guess it is. Yeah, I guess yeah. it, it seriously is. Yeah, yeah. So some people, some people uh, do that. So, so yeah. So there's, there's a few different, few different pieces there. You got, you got to think about. Um, you know, in terms of of building the team, having the right capital or net worth, or of course, as you have taught for many years. Russ is having the right partners as well, or bringing the right partners to the table that that's that adds some to that, whether it's cash or net worth or qualification or building experience, that sort of thing. Yep. Um, so a lot of different, a lot of different things to think about. And then construction financing in general, you know, is is typically done on a draw basis. So basically, you get uh, you get mortgage funds as you are con- as you are constructing the property that you're building. So you spend some money or, or, or you do some work to construct the property. Maybe you put the foundation in and then you, se- you send over your invoices to a professional that reviews them, sees that the work is done. And then the, they recommend to the bank to give you the money. The bank then gives you the money yep. and then you build some more. And you sort of do that every month. And it's sort of a monthly process that, that you do. And it's, it's called con- um, construction draws or a draw mortgage where you're getting uh, getting the mortgage in tranches as you're completing the project, so the lender can ensure that you're um, you're actually completing the pro the 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 project as planned. Um, and and you also you also have to think about um, not just like the 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 draws the the progress, but also you know a lot of people ask, what about interest payments? Do I need to make interest payments every month? And so what's actually pretty nice is that your interest budget actually forms part of your construction budget and the lender lends you on that entire budget. So they, you don't actually have to make interest payments every month. It's actually part of your construction budget that the lender can either have set aside that they can draw from every month for interest payments. So, you know, it's, you don't have to necessarily set it aside, set us or think about monthly interest payments when you're uh, under construction. Yeah. So, so bottom line is what I heard there is number one is, there has to be a kind of a business plan in place, right? Not just, you know, in most cases, you know, go back to residential games. I'm, well, I'm just buying this house on Main Street. Okay, they send an appraiser out, it praises, it goes, okay, no problem. But in this case, they're going to they're gonna look a little deeper in, okay, what's your plan? Okay, you're buying this house, got it, but what's your plan? Okay, I'm going to turn this from one house into uh, four units, 
stack townhomes with suites and it's going to rent for $15,000. Here's the performers. Here's all this kind of stuff. Here's my business team. Here's the construction team. Here are the drawings. Here's a rough budget on things like that. And then you hit, hand that off to you and you go, okay, now I can work with this, right? Is that is that a, a fair assessment is kind of have your plan together about what you're doing before you go talk to, to a professional like yourself? Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head, Russ. That really well said. Okay. So then we we would go and we'd make an application to you. And let's say we have a lot of this preliminary work already done. And, and uh, we go to you. I imagine we fill out a form. We fill out some information. What's kind of the, the application process that you look for and some of the steps there? Yeah, so I would say like if, if you're if you're doing a construction mortgage, um, you know, having having an idea of, of um ideally you've you've got the land under contract or, or you already own it, but if not, you know, you have a clear plan of what you're gonna be doing. Um and then looking at really having a high level sketch of of what you're gonna be building. So even though it doesn't have to be fully completed drawings, but maybe it's a rough idea of the unit mix, this many three bedroom townhomes, this many one bedroom basement suites, here's a square footage, here's a number of bathrooms. So how you have an idea of what that looks like. Um, and then of course the construction budget, as I mentioned, like what is it gonna to cost to build, um, you know, what's a construction cost? But, you know, it's interesting enough, construction budget is, is made up of hard costs, that's your, actual physical costs you're going to spend. And then there's also soft costs. And that's the costs like architects and permits and marketing and financing fees and, and financing interest reserves and, and all of that, all of that, those costs as well that often come before you actually start construction. So having sort of a reasonably fleshed out budget um, is also important. And then and then we can dive in and, and provide feedback on a few different things. And this is actually really interesting we have we often look at projects and and provide feedback that hey this is actually not this is not actually not profitable you're gonna it's gonna be worth this much when you're done and it's gonna cost you this much to build and there isn't much of a profit margin in, in there so you're gonna be spending a lot of time effort and energy to build this and when you're done it's gonna be worth the same or less than what you what you, what you spent and it's not only is it something people should really think about whether they want to do or not but secondly it can also be cha- make it challenging to get financing for yeah it. so yeah. So really, that's one of the things we look at is, is does that make sense? Is the budget reasonable? What does the value look like? What does the projected income look like? And then then as a result, what what possible mortgage might look like? So the way that uh, one of the ways that mortgages are, de- are determined on construction loans is what does the mortgage amount look like when the building is done and and spitting out some income? And how does how does the, the income of the property compare to the projected mortgage payment that that mortgage would have yep. and what's that what's that debt service ratio so that's really what we're gonna what we'd get into but the, the foundational pieces are really what's the what is the land worth what are you buying what are you building and how much is going to cost to build well wow, that's uh so so really your your role in this is an awful lot more is you you vet business plans and you're you're another pair of eyes to to take a look to see if this is a viable business and it's something that makes sense and it's not just a you know, I use the term all the time as it, it's not like downhill skiing in Saskatchewan, a long climb for a short slide, right? Oh, if, oh hang on a second. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, sorry. That's, that's, that's my attempt at some humor there, brother. So. <laughs> yeah. So no, that's, that's, that's really well said. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then let's say you, you go through the vet process and, and, you know, it looks, it looks, you know, everything looks, you know, amber lights and green lights and a little bit more information. And you have to sign over to your first born children and, you know, you have to know the dog's names and you have to, you know, get all these, all this document. And let's say it's, it's checking all the checks and balances. What's kind of the, the next step in the process for the construction for financing side of things? Yeah, so I would say like once once all the checks and balances make sense, then we would um, really collect a lot more information around the the borrower, their their ability to to uh, to guarantee the loan and, and what you know what their net worth is like, those sort of pieces. And then we we engage with the borrower, you know, make sure they're comfortable hiring us, working with us to to do their mortgage for them collect that information and then we put together sort of a 30 to 40 page presentation that we that outlines the project itself who the borrower is what their experience is who's building it how much it's going to cost what it's going to be worth when it's done what are the key ratios for the lender where is it located what is the, the property um going to look like when it's done like all of these pieces together 
Um, we put the, put it together in a presentation, and then we we market it to lenders. Essentially, we're, we're pitching lenders on this deal, saying, "Here's a project," um, and it's you know they they know sort of all the key metrics and ratios that they that they want to know is already there, easy to find, and so it's very easy and quick for them to say, "Yes, we like it. Here's why. Here's how much we would lend on it." Um, and then we provide that feedback to the borrower, and and uh, they have an idea of what uh, what their options are. Okay, so in in vernacular that maybe some rain members would understand is you're putting together our binder for us, and you're then shopping the deal. Now, if it was CMHC, do you pitch to CMHC first before you go to lenders, and then you have to get some kind of a a blessing from the pulpit, if you will, or or how does that kind of work if we're going yes, to CMHC? Yeah, great, great question. Yeah, so for CMHC for sure, and this is actually really important because. Region for us is, you know, um, we actually able to go directly to CMHC to pitch the deal, negotiate the loan uh, on the on the behalf of the borrower. Unfortunately, there's there's mortgage workers out there that are trying to do this as well on the multifamily side, but they're not actually able to pitch CMHC directly, and they're they're pitching it to a lender that then pitches it to CMHC, which in our mind takes a lot longer, is not as valuable. Yep. For the, for the borrower. So yeah, so we, we go to CMHC and we actually get from them, the end result from them is, our, is what we call our certificate of insurance. Them saying, yes, we will provide insurance for this loan. And then you take that insurance in that presentation and you go to lenders and you're basically saying, look, CMHC has approved this deal and they're, they require a lot of due diligence and therefore it's being de-risked, de-risked a lot. So, you know, are you willing to quote on it? And they would typically put a much lower interest rate than than a lender would quote if they didn't have that certificate. Right. So, and then you yeah. you don't have the money per se in green birch. You go out to different equity firms and you shop the deal around and you know, essentially, I got one, I got one. Who wants to bid on it or something like that? Is that kind of the process? Exactly. Yeah. Once we have that certificate of insurance from from CMHC, then then we shop it to different lenders. And, and see who wants to bid on it. And and what are the what are kind of firms do this? Like it's not like you know it's not like your big five banks. These are kind of more private equity firms. Or what kind of what kind of firms are these that that provide these financing? Yeah. So so actually the the, the banks are in this in this space okay. too. Like uh, certain they have a certain risk appetite that that isn't always um, conducive to to all loans. But but yeah. So so whether it's through CMHC. Um, insurance or not, uh, banks are there, the credit unions are there. There's also, uh, I would say, insti- like mortgage investment corporations or institutions that that lend on mortgages, that's their business. Um, and, and there's, you know, private equity firms as well, mezzanine lenders. There's a whole gamut. I mean, for example, we have a roster of over 150 lenders. Oh, wow. Uh, so, we won't always go to all 150 for all deals, but we'll, we'll handpick um, 10, 15, 20, maybe uh, for every deal, make sure it's well suited to the deal. Well, you you probably that's why we hire you, is you know which which horse is the one that's that's running fast and that has good that has the good terms and the one that has you know, to blankly put it out there, which one has the money to lend in essence. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so you make a really good point, which is, you know, a lot of times people think it's just about the interest rate. It's interest rate, interest rate, yeah. interest rate. But in reality, there's so much more to it. Like a lot of times, we'll provide feedback to clients to the level of, well, this this is this this is how fast they can move. Here's how fast they did their last few deals. So if speed's an issue. Yep. You really want to look at this for us as opposed to that one. Or flexibility. Well, this one will allow for a second mortgage or a VTP if you ever need it, or if you have one right now, this one won't. So what are the different things that are important to you? Um, you know, even for construction loans, here's a here's a lender that'll do the construction mortgage. And when you're done, you know, their takeout or their permanent loan pricing is actually not as competitive as the other lenders. So the construction loan pricing might be good, but look two years down the down the line when you're done, what does the t- the takeout pricing look like? Right. So we, we provide sort of that that depth of um of, of feedback to borrowers, which which I think is mm-hmm. is really important for people to pay attention, not just interest rates. Yeah, and and just knowing the full picture, bef- knowing the full picture, and knowing the back door before you get in the front door at the same time, because exactly. you're going okay. So if we're doing this project, okay, Russ, what's your end goal of this? Well, the end goal of this is after we build it, we're going to then rent it out for seven to ten years. Okay, well then here's the loan that you want to have. Is you you structure it from the from the end outcome backwards if you will. And here's the best way to save them. Instead of doing two applications, we'll do it with this one and then it just roll into the next one. And then all you have to do is get one approval and you're, and you're, and you're stay golden pony boy. Right. Exactly. Okay. Do you know the reference to stay golden pony boy? 
No, no I, it's funny. I, I have to. I have to always measure my. my um, have you ever seen The Outsiders? The movie no, The Outsiders. Haven't. Okay, there's there's famous in there. Stay Golden Pony Boy, and I always have to always have to um, be careful of the references that I use. In a funny story. Do you might you have a time for a funny story? Yeah, it's not. It's, it. If my wife was here, she would go. Oh God, Russ, don't tell the story. It's because I have such a, a weird sense of humor sometimes. So I was at the AV store the other day and check, and I had to get a piece of equipment fixed and come back. And I said, what was wrong with it? And they came back and they said, oh, it was a capacitor issue. They fixed the capacitor. And I go, damn, I sure hope it wasn't the flux capacitor. And then the person that behind the counter was the young guy. He was looking at me and, and I said, I go, you know, did I put one, 1. 1.20 gigawatts of power through the flux capacitor? And he's still looking. I go, you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? And he goes, no. He goes, dude, I don't. I go, did you ever watch Back to the Future? <laughs> and then he goes, he goes, oh man, I saw that when I was like seven. <laughs> and I go, Th- thanks. <laughs> so, anyways, so gang, yeah. if you understand uh, the flux capacitor, or if you understand State Golden Pony Boy, those are just two references of me <laughs> showing my age here a little bit. So, <laughs> that's Love about it. as fun as I get. That's about as <laughs> funny as I get. Okay, so construction financing. Obviously, we could literally just go through almost line by line. But here's the thing is details matter. The plan matters. And having a professional that knows what they're talking about to navigate the waters is probably the most important thing. And I'm not here to pump your tires uh, I'm here to tell you this is the truth. My truth is have somebody who's an expert at knowing what they're doing that does this all day long, um, as opposed to you to try to navigate the waters on your own. Yeah. Right now. Okay. So, so, okay. So that's construction side. Now, what about the completion mortgage side of the MLI select? So let's, let's take it in a, as a standalone. So let's say I'm buying a multi-res property. And let's just, for argument's sake, say it's normalized, it's stabilized, it's doing well, it's maybe a new build, and it's got eight units, and I know my numbers, and I'm buying it off of the builder. What's the process to just kind of get that mortgage application and timelines and costs and stuff like that going? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, if if you're buying if you're buying a property that's brand new, then you know you're not going to have any any historic income from the property. And so what CMAC relies on is an appraisal for projected income. So the, an appraisal will give you projected income, projected expenses, and CMAC will rely more on that. Um, and so the appraisal becomes a really key component of, of buying an existing building, uh, buying a new building, sorry. If you're buying an existing building, then paying attention to what the rent roll is, which is basically a list of all the tenants and how much they're paying, as well as the operating statement, which goes, goes through pretty much all the expenses, um, and, and really picking up on what those what those key expenses are. And I always like to say the three key expenses to pay attention to: property tax, insurance, and utilities. The reason being those are those are actual expenses. There's other expenses like property management, but, but guess what? You might have a seller that manages a property himself and doesn't pay himself, so you're not going to see a property management expense there. Or you might have someone that. Um, has a company that's their cousin's company that they're paying more than market to, for property management, it, it, or, or you know, another lot, another expense is repairs and maintenance. Well, you might have a building that someone's really not maintaining it very well, and to have a really low repairs and maintenance line item, or somebody that had done a whole bunch in the last uh, recent while that looks like a higher number. And so I always like to say those three exp- expenses: property tax, utilities, insurance. Actuals are really important to get. The rest, they tend to be benchmarked in, in the commercial world. So CMHC appraisers will benchmark the rest of them regardless of what actuals are. Uh, so keep that keep that in mind. You buy an existing building, really try and make sure you get get a hold of those three key expenses and, and don't sweat the other ones yeah, too much. Now, utilities, um, if you're able to get separate meters, I imagine that would be quite beneficial if you could pass that expense on to your tenants, I would imagine. Or do you do you apply a factor? So for example, a lot of the ones I do is I include utilities in my rent and I charge for the utility amount. Like I charge a rent and a utility amount. Is that kind of broken up separately as well as there? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely can be. So it's it's really like what what really matters is what the landlord is paying for utility expense. Right. So gotcha. tenants paying the utilities doesn't really matter what they are as much, but if the landlord's paying it, um, then it's important. So in your case, if you're if you're charging tenants a certain utility allowance, and then you're actually paying the bill, then what is the actual bill that you're 
you're paying. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let's let's pivot and talk about the kind of the point system. I know we touched on it briefly. Now, is it fairly like a structured kind of how they do that? Or is there a little bit of a nebulous of, a, do you have to do an energy audit? Do you have to do things like how does affordability get determined? Like how does that, or is it a, a little bit of art in there as well? Like how, how are those, yes. how are those calculated? Yeah, for sure. I'm going to um, see here, maybe I can share my, my screen briefly. So this, so this is what the point system looks like. Um, you know, you, you have existing properties, they have, um, you know, 50, 70, or 100 points for affordability, 30, 50, or 100 points for energy efficiency, and 20 or 30 points for accessibility. And so the three levels of points are 50, 70, and 100. And if you get, you you sort of, if you get, uh, if you want to do affordability, you have to have anywhere from 40 to 60 to 80% of the units being deemed affordable in the building, or you have to commit to improving the energy efficiency by 15, 25, or 40%. Um, and then finally, for accessibility, you have to meet a certain percentage of units in the building as being accessible, 15% here. Uh, and to get a bit more points, it's 15% plus, or having a few other factors. And then you can kind of mix and match your rest. You can do you know, 50 points, a little bit of 50 points for affordability, a little bit of maybe 30 points for energy efficiency, and then 20 points for accessibility, and that in total adds up to 100 points. And then if you get, depending on how many points you get in total, then you have these sort of benefits. With 100 points, you get up to 95% leverage, up to a 50-year amortization. Um, and so these are some of the benefits that apply if you, um, if you get if you get a certain level of points. So to answer your question, in some ways, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of an art and a science, depending on the art is really what, what do you pick and choose sort of, uh, you know, pick, pick your own adventure here, if you will. Um, how do you want to get to a certain point level? And then the science is once you do that, there's math involved in adding your points together and then resulting in certain benefits. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that, that helps. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and I remember you were in one of our conversations, you were saying that you're getting most Alberta investors like a hundred points just on affordability alone. I yeah, we have exactly. to, we have to fix that, don't we? Get that rent, get those rents up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm, I'm I'm joking, but I'm not at the same time. Yeah, uh, Alberta yeah. is ridiculously on unaf- ridiculously affordable at the moment for for rent. Like I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and I said, "What would you rent in your market for three bedroom, two and a half bath house? This, that, and the other." And they say, "Yeah, that's about four thousand bucks." Like, holy crap! I'm only charging like twenty two hundred at the moment. <laughs> Yeah. And, and look, I mean, like, you know, in, in Alberta, what you're really doing is you're really committing to a form of rent control, essentially, because, um, you know, certain markets like BC and Ontario have rent control, Alberta doesn't. But if you commit units to being affordable, it's you're right, it's easier to qualify for being affordable. But then you're committing that you're not if you're not going to increase the rents by as much as the market allows, you're limiting how much you can increase your rent by to whatever inflation is for for base for for rented housing in the province, so right. you're you're agreeing to a form of rent control. Yeah, in, if you do it in Alberta. Oh well, yeah, that's that's good to know. And I had, I had a conversation with another fellow, and he said that he goes one of the reasons why he's not applying for this yet is because he believes that rents are going to go up faster than inflation. And then he he said that once I get rents up to a normalized what I believe it should be, then I'll probably go back and apply for this kind of if it's still available. Who, who knows? And sometimes you know, we get a different color of government on there and all. And what I mean by different color, different color of party, obviously that's what I meant. And and you get that different um, party in place. And all of a sudden there's a new rule in place with this as well as like, and then all of a sudden now rent controls everywhere. Albertans, please vote, please vote correctly in a few weeks. Just sorry. Sorry if I get, (laughs) I'm not going to say what direction to vote. I'm just saying, just make sure you have your voices heard and vote. That's all I'm going to say. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so so suffice it to say, these are um, incredible financing opportunities, and you know I would imagine your your phone has probably been ringing off the hook quite a bit of late to people to do this, and and really, like I said earlier, what's not to love 
Like there are so many benefits of this and I'm just doing some analysis on some properties that honest to goodness for a $2 million multi-res brand new construction type of a property, we can get into it for like $150,000 down payment in, in many cases, including fees, including stuff like that. Like, like that's unheard of. Like that's really unheard of. And it cash flows when you factor in a little bit of a discounted interest rate, but the 50 year amortization just makes sure that it will cash flow as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's well designed and it's 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 exactly what the government wants is people to create more housing. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it's a perfect example of why someone would. Well, but there's got to be a catch. Like, is it just my skeptic of me of saying, is there, is it just too good to be true or, or like, 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 and then the other say I say is if, if it was that easy, everybody would be doing. And it's, it, there's obviously there's fine points and there's qualification and there's nuances, but is it really, is it really all that it's cracked up to be? Yeah. You know what, Russ, it's a really good question. I mean, there's a lot of skepticism when the program first launched and people almost didn't believe it. Um, and I mean, we've gotten... I think we're up to 64 approvals. Like I've personally been involved in getting 64 deals approved um, since the program launched. Uh, we're in May of 23. It was May, March of 22 that it, that it launched. Um, and we've had virtually every file uh, we applied for get approved. And you know, part of that is us vetting it ahead of time for qualification, as you allude to, making sure that people will qualify, the deal will qualify. Um, so, so I would say, yeah, it, the program is there. I mean, here's the drawbacks, Russ. Like, um premiums as we talked about you have to pay insurance premiums for it you got to factor that in gets add gets added to your mortgage but it ultimately it is a cost even though it's not out of your pocket um processing time that's another drawback um cmac uh you know you got to plan for say say four months to to get your your funds from cmac so it's not as quick as it would be otherwise if you need money in a rush this isn't the, the financing program for you you gotta you gotta plan to wait for it um you know it takes it takes about two months for CMHC to even pick up your file after after we submit it, um, and then it takes a few weeks to approve. Uh, and then you get you know lenders and lawyers adds another four to six weeks to that. Um, so you you know you want to you want to plan for four months for it. Yeah. Um, but and then aside from that though, you know you follow the, the qualifications and and keep in mind the ninety five percent leverage is not. An automatic. It's not a guarantee. That debt service ratio that we talked about is really crucial. So in markets like if you're in the lower mainland in Vancouver, if you're right in the in the in Toronto, the cap rates are really low, which means the values are quite high, but the cash flow isn't as strong. And so in those markets, if you're trying to build, you know, it's not as easy to get 95% loan to cost or loan to value because your debt service ratio will be will constrain you before you get to that leverage point. So that's the other thing too is yep. that leverage is not guaranteed. You got to really you got to really uh, account for that ratio of debt service. Nice, nice. But and one of the things you do and correct me if I'm wrong in this process is you have internal underwriting and internal deal underwriting that you you will vet the deal and you will sit there and go, you know, 100%. We don't have CMHC approval certificate yet, but based upon everything we've seen, we strongly think that you will get it, but it's going to take four months. And um, from my understanding, you're batting a thousand percent so far, aren't you? With 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 your underwriting to to getting it to getting it approved. Yeah, for, for sure. And I, and I think what one of the like you know having done so many gives us a really good really good sense for yep. for sort of where the guardrails are. But the, the other thing to think about too is there's some interest rate risk. So when you come back to your question about how to, how does commercial and residential compare? Residential mortgage, you can often, you know, get a rate hold, if you will. That doesn't really exist for for a CMHC mortgage. There's a couple couple of ways you're taking interest rate risk. If you're buying a building, and we're talking about that debt service ratio, and if interest rates spike up, as you, we talked about, like just where we are today, the like, last week they've really jumped up. Um, that could impact the amount of loan that you could get. So you got to really pay attention to interest rate. You're taking an interest rate risk because you can't lock that interest rate in a commercial mortgage until you actually have approval from CMHC. Right. Then, and you choose a lender, then you can lock an interest rate. So there's interest rate risk that could impact how much your payments are, but also how much loan you get because the amount of interest rate will impact your mortgage payment, which impacts your debt service ratios. Mm, yep. Makes sense. Um, so that's what you think about. And the other thing too is like construction financing. So if you're building something, construction financing, 
generally, you have to actually take a floating rate interest rate during construction. And it's only when the project is completed that you lock in the permanent financing. And during construction, I mean, I saw this happen, um, you know, projects that started in 2020, 2021, when they finished in 2022, the interest rate environment looked very different from what it did when they started construction. Yeah. And that's why and, probably a lot of people kind of shelved the project until they had a little more certainty. And it was probably cheaper to let it be on the shelf than it was to keep moving forward with it. Yeah, exactly. So like, that's something to think about too, is, you know, there's, there's some, there's some sensitivity to interest rates. And um, I, I get this question every day, Russ, what are rates going to do? Where are rates going to go? Uh, and it's and it's a it's a tricky question to answer. I, I don't have the answer. I can, I can guess just like everybody else, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, I, I wish I knew what interest rates would do, and I also wish I was seven foot four and could dunk a basketball too. Right? So it's like, unfortunately, it's one of those things. Is you know sometimes you have to do take some risk on this, but having a professional on your side to navigate through the waters, you know will help de-risk this having a good captain on your side and having a good crew on your side will help you as well all right my friend we could we could go on and on and on um do you do i have your permission to reach out to you again and maybe have a little bit of a deeper conversation around this and maybe do some specific case studies with some certain product properties or things like that like we talked a lot of general high level 30,000 foot uh, would you be open to doing some look at into like some specific files of properties and just kind of finding what the options were and what you finance and here was the challenge here was the problem here was the opportunity and here's what we placed with it yeah i would love that yeah, I, I think that'd be fun i think that'd be a fun thing is yeah. do, do real life like a real life case study on some real real life deals that would be like you know where the rubber hits the road and i know some projects that potentially could use upcoming yeah so. absolutely Okay, so very good. Now, before I let you off, I do have a question I want to ask here at the end is one that I ask all my guests at the end. And I'm, 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 I'm not going to give you the question yet. But before I ask that question, I wanted to just acknowledge you and I wanted to just thank you for being a wonderful person with high standards that wants to raise and elevate the game in the commercial lending space. You, if you go through your website, you will see um, that you, you not only say all the buzzwords and say all the right terms, you actually, I know for a fact, you live them. And I've just had conversations with people that have worked with you and you just get, this is the best compliment I can give a mortgage broker is you get the deal done. You just get it done and you get it done on time and you get it done with the best opportunity based upon the scenario. And I guess that's the best compliment I can give you is you just get deals done and you do it the right way. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. And please know there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a really great team behind me as well. It's not just me. Under, well, absolutely. See, that's what a good leader does. Now, before I do ask you the last question here, um, where would a person be able to reach out to you? Where's the best contact information? Where do you kind of hang? Do you do social media? What's the best place to get a hold of you, my friend? Yeah, LinkedIn is is uh, is my social media of choice right yep. now. So spending spending a lot of time on LinkedIn um, and uh, and website email. Um, you, you get you get my email address for my website uh, under the under the contact or the our our team. Um, use my, my phone number and email address is right right on there, and um, you can feel free to feel free to send me an email or um, or reach out to me on uh, on LinkedIn. Nice, nice. Is this is Alyssa your wife? She is, yeah. Oh, nice. Family I didn't I, I didn't know that she was chief operating officer. So she she tells you she gives you all the direction on what you need to do, right? That's She's that's a that's a good that's a good decision that you had probably, right? Well done. Well done, my friend. Um, okay. Final, final question that I want to leave off here with is, is, so if somebody was sitting here and maybe they're feeling just a little bit stuck, right? They're just, you know, they're just not sure about the next steps and they're not sure about, um, you know, diving in. Maybe they're, they've bought a portfolio of single families and they're maybe wanting to jump into commercial. And we were having a coffee at Starbucks here and and uh, what uh, what advice would you give that person to help that person take the next step and maybe just get unstuck? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I would say a few things. One is talk to people that have done what they are trying to do um, and, and you have, have gotten there, and 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 really be okay with um, with being humble uh, because I see this quite a lot 
if somebody has, has done really well in the residential world, but when they move over to the commercial world, they're really learning from scratch and really being humble about learning, um, talking to people that have done it, talking to people that are in the industry as well, whether it's a mortgage broker or, you know, a, a, commer- a multifamily realtor and commercial realtor and people that are people that are in and around the business that can have insights. Um, having having a coach is really invaluable too, uh, whether it's real estate specific or even even some kind of life coach or even a mentor. Um, really, really to balance things off of, I think are really valuable. So you know, being humble, talk to people that have done what you're going to do, talk to people in and around the space you're going to be at, and look at uh, having a coach or a mentor. Okay. Probably my four big ones. Wow. Yeah, real estate is a team game. Even though we feel like we might be going alone, it 100% is a team game. And I consider you a wonderful team player and a wonderful member on on my team here. And uh, gang, I would strongly encourage you if you are looking for some good commercial financing uh, opportunities. You you work national wide, Canadian wide, my friend. Yep, everywhere yep. except Quebec right now. Everywhere except for where? Quebec. Okay, no comment. But <laughs> I I agree. nothing against it with Quebec. It's just the regulatory environment. It's just uh, it takes a little longer. Yeah. I agree. Now, gang, so uh, I think we'll just leave it there for today. Um, By all means, uh, reach out if you have any questions or maybe want to see if there's a fit that Deem's given you his uh, contact information. But if you also want to see if there's a fit for you or if there's maybe um, maybe on the the investment side, the project side, if this is a fit for you to want to get involved in something like that, let me know. I'd love to help you out to see if this is a fit for you to get into a, one of these kind of a projects as well before I connect you with Nadim as well, you know, with things like that. So just want to make sure that getting into a project like this is a fit and then I'll connect you with Nadim. And it would be a better connection if it came from me than if it just it was a cold connection out there as well. Okay, gang, with all that being said... Until the next one, bye for now, everybody. Hey, wait a minute. You're still here. Didn't you know the video is over? You know what? Since you stuck around right to the very end, it's time for a little reward, a little bonus for you. Number one, make sure you subscribe. There will be a button below here. Hit that subscribe button, bell notification to not miss an upcoming episode. And over here will be a hand-selected playlist and the next video for you to watch to keep your momentum going forward. All right, gang, let's go.